children's church and adults that are staying, how grateful are you for God's faithfulness today? It's truly overwhelming to think how faithful He is to us even in the midst of our faithlessness at times. And so please don't forget or don't take God's faithfulness for granted in your life. Uh, It's always wonderful being with you. Let's turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. We've been walking with Israel through the wilderness. And um, as we go to Exodus 17, as you're finding your place there, I want to ask you a question this morning. First, have you ever wondered if the Lord was among you or not? Have you ever wondered if God was present with you in the midst of your trials, in the midst of your circumstances, and in the midst of your life? Before you go all high and mighty and say you've never doubted God's presence, I really want you to think about this today. Because I can almost guarantee that all of us in here have had a time or two where we have genuinely wondered, God, where are you? God, I can't feel your presence. God, do you even care what I'm going through right now? Many people wonder this in their lives, if the Lord is among them or not, in moments where people tragically lose loved ones, the question comes out inevitably, God, are you here? When moments when people lose their jobs, inevitably someone questions in their mind, God, do you care about me? When the waves of life keep crashing on you and you can't seem to get back to the top, so many people wonder, God, are you here? In the turmoil of life, it's easy to question God's presence, isn't it? It's also easy to question God's provision. God, are you going to provide for me in this circumstance? It's also easy to question God's protection in our lives. And once we start to question those three things, his presence, his provision, and his protection, then it becomes easier and easier to do this one thing. It becomes so easy to not trust God altogether. And maybe you've even been there in your life, where you truly are questioning whether or not you can trust God. Maybe you're in there right now. Maybe you're going through some situations in life right now where you are questioning whether or not you can trust God. But I want to tell you today that that's a dangerous place to be, isn't it? That's a dangerous place to live, not trusting God. To be living your life, not looking to Him for all things, because instead of trusting God, what happens is that we end up starting to put God on trial, accusing Him of doing or not doing all sorts of things in our lives, testing Him to see if He actually cares for us. I know this kind of seems outrageous to say and really bring up in our lives that God's people would put their own God on trial, that they would put their own God to the test, that they would hurl accusations at Him deny what he's done, and question his motives. But I guarantee we do this more often than we think. You see, in our text today, we are going to see Israel do exactly this. God's people who have just literally walked through the Red Sea, where God provided bitter water and made it sweet, where he provided bread, where he provided quail, where he's given them everything they've needed in life, and yet we come to Exodus 17, and here we go. Instead of trusting him, they're going to put God on trial. Instead of praising him, they're going to put God to the test. Instead of really thinking and trusting God in their lives, they're going to hurl accusation after accusation after accusation at God, thinking he is not with them. But the beauty of the story is found in how God responds. How God responds today. 
So let's jump in. We're just going to cover seven verses this morning. Exodus 17, 1 through 7. And just remember, right before Exodus 17, in chapter 16, God just gave them quail one night and started giving them manna every single morning. All right, so God is providing every single day. They get to go and they get to pick up the manna and they get to eat what they crave and God provided for them. Now we come to Exodus 17 and it says, All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord. And they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Here we go again. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with these people, Lord? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of the Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? In verse 1, we see that all the congregation of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin. And so they were in the wilderness of sin, and they're moving slowly down to uh, Mount Sinai, or where the rock of Horeb is. And they moved on from the place where they experienced God's power and provision. Remember, God brought quail into the camp. He also started providing them with their daily bread that they need every single day. And so they move on from that place where they experience God's power, God's provision, but they move on in stages according to the commandment of the Lord. And we have to pause here and we have to imagine the scene. Remember, you have 600,000 plus people all camping out all walking through the wilderness. They're gathering manna each morning, getting through each day as best as they can, and then the Lord starts to command them to move on from this place. But instead of all picking up at the same time, we're told here that they moved on in stages. How it all worked out, we don't really know. We don't know which tribe got to go first and which tribe had to go last. We have no clue, but what we do know is that they didn't all move forward at the same time. Now we pause here because remember it's in the wilderness that spiritual growth happens. We talked about that last week. As much as we don't like our wilderness experiences, as, as much as we don't like to be stretched or tested in our lives, let me tell you that's where your spiritual growth is going to happen. And so if you find yourself in comfort, in ease, and convenience for too long, you're going to become complacent and most likely discontent in life. But yet it's in the wilderness where we grow spiritually, we grow as people, we grow in our character. And so the wilderness is a sanctifying season. So praise God for those seasons. Praise God for those hard wilderness seasons because that's where God is growing us as his people. It's a season where we're tested, purified, and we mature in our faith. And so we pause here to really focus on this idea of moving along in stages because we have to remember that spiritual growth doesn't all happen at the same time. Do you know what I would love as a pastor? I would love if every single one of you all grew spiritually together, right? That would make my job so easy. Because I would just know every single one of you is here in your spiritual growth. And then in a year, I would know you're here. And in a year, I would know you're here. That would be great, wouldn't it? If you're a teacher in here today, wouldn't it be great if all your students just got it at the same time? Yeah, amen. But they don't. Some kids go faster. Some kids go slower. Amen, my man. 
You see, they don't grow at the same time. They don't do it. And that's the same way in our spiritual growth. We move along in the sanctification process in stages. Many of you know we grow spiritually progressively. We don't grow spiritually immediately. Now, I know some of you are thinking, yeah, we know this. We've covered this so much. My question for you then is why do we as the church expect other believers to be exactly where we are in our spiritual lives? Because we do that. Whether you know it or not, we do that as the body of Christ. One of the downfalls of the body of Christ is thinking that other people are where you are in the sanctification process. That other people should love the way that you love. Oh, well, I love people this way. You should do it exactly how I do it as well. You think they should serve the way you serve. So many people say, this is what I've done. How come those people aren't doing what I'm doing in my life? So many people think that they should do it the way that I've been doing it in my life. Listen, church, we cannot think this way. We all grow spiritually in different stages. Every single one of us. Some will progress in their love at different points of their lives. Some will progress in their kindness and in their mercy. Some will progress in their service and their action with others. But we cannot expect or place that expectation on other people saying, well, I'm here. Why aren't you with me? Well, listen, it's because we grow in stages. Every single one of us, we grow in stages. And so instead of thinking people need to be where you are, we actually need to do the opposite. We need to help people grow. The teachers don't just say, you know what, everybody has to be here when it comes to math. And you know what? If you don't get here, we're just going to leave you behind. No, teachers, what do they do? They go back and they help those students who aren't there yet. Don't they? Good teachers do that. And then they go forward with the students who are a little further, and they say, you know what? I'm going to help you go even further. I love what teachers do because that is a picture of what we need to be doing as the body of Christ, which is discipleship. Instead of expecting people to be where we are and scoffing at them and saying, hey, why aren't you over here? How about we as the church go and walk with them and help them grow spiritually? That's what discipleship is. That's what we are called to do as the body of Christ. We are called to help people along on the journey of faith. And that means that starts with your family. First and foremost, fathers and mothers, please disciple your children in the way they should go. Your children absolutely need your discipleship. It is not the job of the church to do that. It is your job to do that. We as the church will walk alongside of you and help you. But it is your job as parents, grandparents. You have an amazing opportunity to disciple your grown children. And I know I don't have grown children, so some of you grandparents are like, have you ever dealt with grown children? I have not, all right? But I have been a grown child. I would like to think I'm a grown child today. But it's priceless what my dad has done for me in my life. He's not perfect. He hasn't done the best job in the world, but he has discipled me in certain ways. And I thank the Lord for what my dad's done for me, even as a grown-up. And then also, grandparents, you have grandchildren that you get to pour into, some more, some less, depending on where they live. But listen, we as the body of Christ need to focus on discipleship. And if you don't have kids or grown kids, guess what? There are, the body of Christ is here, and we get to help people grow in their salvation, in their journey of faith. And so instead of thinking that other people need to be where you are or to do it the way you've done it or to serve the way you think it should be done, let's help them and model for them what it should look like. Get to know some people. Get to invest in people's lives and say, come on. I've done this for a long time. I want to show you how to do this. I want to show you why I'm doing this and see how God works. We can't sit here all high and mighty and say, you know what? I'm here. You should be with me. I'll wait till you get to me. That's not how the body of Christ works. We need to be focused on discipleship. And if you're younger in your faith today, if you haven't been on the journey of faith as long, it's the, don't just wait for someone to come to you. I've said this multiple times. You need to ask someone to mentor you in your life. 
reach out to someone who's older, who's been along the journey and say, hey, I've seen you as a father. I've seen you at, at church. I've seen you serve. Would you disciple me? Would you mentor me in my life? There's not enough mentorship happening within the church. There's not enough discipleship happening. And that's why so many churches are, are failing. That's why so many people are walking away from the church because no one's willing to really pour into that next generation. We will grow spiritually in stages. But remember, here's the beauty of it. It all happens according to the commandment of the Lord. So God commanded Israel to move along in stages. And so they had to follow God's command in their lives. And that happens in our discipleship as well. We are commanded to disciple others. We plant, we water, but like Paul said, it's God who gives the growth. He is the one that progresses us along in our faith by his spirit, but he loves to use God's people to do that. And so the next time you get mad at someone for not being where you are, remember that we need to be committed to discipleship and we need to be remember that it's the, they move along by the commandment of the Lord. And so, even though God has been sanctifying his people in the wilderness, since they have crossed the Red Sea, we can see that there's still a lot of work to be done for Israel because of how they respond to God at Rephidim. And so once they get to Rephidim, they find out that there's a problem. What's the problem in the text? There's no water. Thank you. Don't be shy, all right? There's no water, okay? There's no water. So here we go again, right? This is... This is kind of a theme happening since they've walked through the Red Sea. They get to Mara, there's bitter water, God makes it sweet. They get to the wilderness of sin, they crave all this food, God provides all the food. They get here and there's no water, so what would be your response? How would you respond to God in this moment? Would you say, you know what God, you've provided three times over, I'm going to trust you and you're going to provide water this time, I know it. Is that how you would respond? We'd all like to think so, right? All of us would say, yeah, that's exactly how I would respond, with complete trust in God. It's not how they respond, is it? You would think that when they get to Rephidim and there was no water to drink, they would think God's got this. But they don't. They go right back into their questioning and testing and quarreling and grumbling. When they get to Rephidim, there's no water to drink. Which, just remember, I know this is similar to when it was Mara, but there's no water here. At Mara, there was actual water. It was just bitter, and God made it sweet. And so they could see the water, and then they could drink the water. And so this is a little bit of a deeper test for God's people because there's no water, none. And so if God was going to provide, he was going to have to bring water from somewhere. And that's what they had to trust God for. They had to trust God that they would bring water. He would bring water out of nothing. And so instead of trusting God, this is what they do. They put God on trial. They put God on trial. They put God to the test. Rephidim was supposed to be a place of testing, but not for God. Rather, it was a place for testing for God's people. They were the ones that were on trial here. But of course, sinful people always like to flip everything on its head. And instead, they want to put God on trial. They want to test him and see what he's doing. And how do, they know, how do we know that they were putting God on trial? Well, first, in verse 2, we are told what's the first thing they do. They found they had no water, and it says, Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses. The people quarreled with Moses. The word, the word quarreled here is a strong word suggesting that they've reached a new level of hostility. And so they've, they, were, they get to Mara and they grumble. They get to the wilderness of sin and they grumble. And then it just keeps building. And if you have kids, you know exactly how that happens, right? They grumble a little bit, and then they grumble a little bit more, and then they grumble a lot. And that's when we react, right? 
This is a new level of hostility, which means that there was, they were revolting in this moment. Can you imagine an angry mob of 600,000 people, thirsty, wanting water, and yet there's not a single drop of water to be seen? And they were casting the blame on Moses, which means they were ultimately casting the blame on God. Listen, for the fourth time since they've walked through the Red Sea, they were grumbling, quarreling, murmuring, but yet this was on a whole new level. And so that's how it started. They were grumbling, they were quarreling. But then in verse 2, we're also told that they tested the Lord. It says, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? The word test here means a trial by ordeal. That's what that word test means, a trial by ordeal. And it's also a term in the Old Testament that's used for a covenant lawsuit. And so you can see here that this is in the form of a trial, if you will, or bringing someone to justice. And in this lawsuit, they presented a list of their accusations against the Lord, which we're going to get into in a little bit. And so they're hurling these accusations at God. They're testing him, saying, you know what? We're, we're putting you, we're sending you a lawsuit. And then in third, the alleged crime that God is accused of was committing capital murder or even genocide. Verse 3, but the people thirsted here for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us? There it is. That's what they think God's trying to do to them. They are accusing God, saying, you are trying to kill us in our lives. We should have just stayed in Egypt. They were blaming God for leading them to a place where there's no water, which means that they're all going to die. And then next, in verse 4, we are told that the people were ready to give God's representative the death penalty. So now that the, the, the blame, the murder, right, that was what he was being accused of. But what's going to be the penalty of that if he's found guilty? If God's found guilty, well, God's representative is going to be put to death. Because Moses does what he should. He cries out to the Lord, and he informs the Lord that they are about to stone him, which is the conventional way of carrying out the death penalty in this time. And so you can imagine the scene a little bit. You have 600,000 people plus, and it's an angry mob. They're revolting. They're accusing God of capital murder. And then they're like, what should we do? Well, we should just stone and get rid of Moses. Just kill him, and we can figure this out by ourselves. And next, we know that they put God on trial because Moses brought the elders of Israel with him. In ancient times, an assembly of elders passed judgment on disputed matters. You'll see that throughout the Old Testament. All the elders were the ones who would pass the judgment. And so this means that in this case, the elders that Moses brought to the rock at Horeb with him were the jury who would witness what would happen next. And then last, we're told in verse 7, and this is how we know that they were putting God on trial, that Moses names the place Massa and Meribah. Look at verse 7. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among you or not? These names are significant because Massa means to test and Meribah means to argue, dispute, or to contend. And so for forever, from this point on all the way till today, that's what this place is known as, a place of testing and arguing, disputing, contending, and putting God on trial. These names imply that a legal case was investigated and decided by ordeal. So you can see clearly from the text that instead of responding with trust, which is what God's people should do, instead of responding with trust and prayer and waiting, God's people responded by putting God on trial and putting God to the test. Even though they knew God, who God was and what God was capable of, 
Instead of saying, surely God who can part the Red Sea can provide water, or surely God who makes bitter water sweet cares about us, or surely the God who makes bread rain from heaven every single morning is with us, they didn't do any of that. Instead, they would rather boldly accuse God of not providing, not protecting, and not being present. That's what they're doing. They're accusing God of not providing, not protecting, and not being present. The accusations of God's people are very clear in this passage. And to be honest, it's kind of mind-blowing that God's people would have the audacity to accuse God of after everything they went through. Doesn't it? You read this text and you're like, how do you even have the audacity to say these things to God after everything he's done for you, all the way from getting you out of Egypt? You witnessed all the plagues. You witnessed God protecting you. You witnessed everything that went on. And yet, here you are trying to literally put to death God's representative because God is trying to kill you in your life. See, I think of, about my life. Sometimes. And I think about how sometimes I accuse God even after all God has done for me. Going through some different things in my life, there are moments where you ask the question, God, do you care what I'm going through? God, are you present in this trial? God, will you provide? what I need right now. And in those, in those moments, instead of asking the questions and lamenting, which is the right thing to do, I'm asking the question accusing, which is, of course, the wrong thing to do as God's children. And so we see their accusations very clear, and these are very convicting because I'm as guilty as them. The accusations of God's people are seen in the three statements that we see from God's people. So they say three statements in these seven verses. First, they say, give us water. Give us water. In this statement, what they are doing is demanding God's provision. They are demanding it, and they're accusing him of not providing, and instead of asking for it and waiting for God to work, they're actually insisting that God work on their terms. They're done waiting. They're done saying, you know what, God, I'll just wait for water from you. They're done with it. They're on this side now where they're saying, God, give us water now or else. They're demanding God's provision on their terms. They're telling God that he has to give them what they want or else something is going to happen. Have you ever done that before? Have you ever tried to tell God what you need in the moment? Maybe you have. As much as we want to scoff at them for doing this, how often do we insist that God work on our terms? How often do we say, hey, God, if you give me this, then I'll do this. Or, God, you know what? You better give me this or else I'm gone and I'm not going to follow you anymore. A lot of us have been there. A lot of us have accused God of not providing for us and demanding it on our own terms. Second, in a sense, they say, don't you care about us? Don't you care about us? In verse 3, we already read it. They asked God, why have you brought us out of Egypt? Was it to watch us die? Is that all you wanted, God? Did you just want to see us suffer? Is this a big joke to you? Are we just your little puppets that you just kind of let out to just die off in the wilderness? All 600,000 plus of us? What they're doing in this statement is denying God's protection. They're accusing him of forsaking and leaving his people. Even after everything that God has done for them, they felt alone. They felt like God failed to keep his promises in their lives. How often do we think that God has abandoned us in our wilderness? Because that's where our minds go. And I speak from experience. You're in those wilderness season and you just feel completely alone. Last, they say, are you even with us? That's in verse 7. Is the Lord among us or not? 
are you even with us? And what they're doing is they're doubting God's presence. They're doubting God's presence. They're accusing him of forsaking and leaving them even after they've done for them. They felt alone. They felt like God failed. So let me ask you this question. Have you ever done this before? These three things right here? Demanding God's provision on your own terms. Denying God's protection, thinking that he doesn't care for you and that he, you're fine just to go off and die and that no one's going to be there for you. And ha- have you ever doubted God's presence? Are you among us or not, Lord? Obviously, Israel did not respond the way they should have, correct? Which we need to learn from. Remember, as we go through Exodus, these are written down for our example to follow. And of course, here we're learning what not to do. And so there's much to learn, there's much for us to learn in this passage, not responding like them. Instead of demanding God's provision, Yes, we should ask for God's provision, but then trust that he's actually going to provide it, right? That's the right way to do it. You can ask God to provide for certain things, but yet it's all on God's terms, not yours. You can go to God and say, God, I don't feel protected here. I don't feel like you're caring about me. Lord, help me understand how much you do care about me. And so instead of denying his protection, just let him know, you know what, Lord, I do know you're protecting us, but I need to see it. And then, are you even with us, is doubting God's presence. If you feel like you're absolutely alone in your life, listen, we need to understand that God does not leave us or forsake us. He's promised us that. And He's promised us that, and He's come through on His promise by sending His Spirit to live amongst us. So you think God's not here? Guess what? If you are a Christ follower, He literally lives within you. That's how close He is no matter what situation you're going through. And so we learn from them, but we learn what not to do. And then, like I said, there is beauty in the story, but the beauty is found in how God responds. The beauty is found in how God responds. And so how did God respond? Just like last week, he didn't smite them. He didn't leave them. He didn't ridicule them. In fact, he didn't even talk to God's people here. Instead, he just talked to Moses. And then he did something amazing. He gave them the water they needed. He gave them the water they needed. He provided water from a rock. Now again, tons of people want to explain this away and be like, oh yeah, well in that area there's aqueducts and if you move a rock, all these springs will come out. No, 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 no. This was a supernatural provision of God out of a rock in a desert. Only God could do this. Only God. Psalm 105, 41. The Psalms are amazing because it brings our minds back to situations like this. But look, he opened the rock and water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river. It flowed through the desert like a river. And so God gave Moses specific instructions. He says, go before the people, take some elders with you. Oh, and also don't forget your staff, the staff that also uh, hit the the, um, Red Sea, which made it part and did a lot of the stuff during the plagues. He says, go to the rock at Horeb, which is a very interesting point that that's where God wanted him to go. Because that's where God first appeared to Moses back at the burning bush was the rock at Horeb. And so here we go. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses is like, how do I know that this is all true? How do I know that you are God? And God says, I'm going to give you a sign. And here's your sign. is that you're going to end up back right here worshiping me. And we get to Exodus 17, and guess where they are? Right where God said they would be, worshiping him. And so the sign that God was going to come through on all of his promises has been kept and fulfilled. And here we go. They are at the rock at Horeb. They're exactly where God 
wants them to. He also goes on to say, and I will be standing before you. Now, whether that's the the pillar of cloud or whether this was a pre-incarnate Jesus who was standing on the rock, we don't know, but God was there. And then God said, strike the rock and water will come out. And guess what Moses did? He was faithful and he did so. He was faithful and he did so. Can you imagine the trust it takes to be like, okay, Lord, 600,000 people need water. And I have to hit a rock? Talk about the trust to say, okay, I'm going to follow through and do exactly what you say. And when he struck that rock, water flowed from the rock. And like Psalm 105, 41 tells us, this was no trickle of water. This was not the spring of water. Have you guys ever seen a picture of the beginning of the Colorado River? And if you don't know what the Colorado River is, it goes through the Grand Canyon, okay? So it's that river that's literally in the Grand Canyon, this massive thing that is there. But the beginning of the Colorado River, guess what? You can stand like this over it because it's just a little simple spring. You can literally stand on either side of the Colorado River at the beginning, at, its, at, at the beginning of this massive river. It was not a spring. What, what flowed from the rock at Horeb was a river right from the beginning, a river that flowed and it could quench the thirst of 600,000 people plus and their livestock. That's how much water came from this rock. And so open your minds a little bit. Don't be thinking of this little dinky river like the Grand River. I'm, I'm even saying big, bigger than the Grand River, I think. Think about what God did in that desert with this massive river coming through and 600,000 people needing to drink, which shows us that what God provided here wasn't just a little bit, but it was sufficient for all of God's people, and it was abundant for every single one of them to quench their thirst. When God provides, He doesn't just provide a little. He overflows, doesn't He? Surely my cup overflows. Is what the Bible talks about. And then when you get to Romans 5, guess what? It talks about the Spirit coming to us, but the Spirit doesn't come just a little bit. It overflows in our hearts. God does not just provide a little bit. He provides what we absolutely need in our lives. And so with the water began to flow before the people, in His mercy and His grace, the Lord was saying a few things to His people. He said, listen, even though you demanded it from me, I gave you water to drink. And when he gave him water to drink, he was saying to his people, I am your provider. I am your provider. And even though you don't think I care about you, the Lord says, I gave you water because I care about you and because I am your protector. I'm going to protect your life and make sure that you can keep going. I'm going to protect you to make sure you know that I am here. And yes, even though you were doubting whether I was with you or not, when God gave that water, he was telling his people, I am all present. I am with you at all times and in every circumstance and in every situation. And I will not leave you nor forsake you. God didn't have to respond this way to sinners, did he? No, he could have just let them all die in that wilderness and moved on. He could have just said, you know what, Moses? We're going we're gonna to pull a Noah. We're going to start over, all right? We're going to just take you, let them all go. But he didn't. Because of his love and his grace and his mercy for his children, he provided exactly what he needed. He protected them, and he was with them in their wilderness experience. Even though we are like Israel at times by putting God on trial and putting them to the test. Even though there are times where we demand God's provision, we deny God's protection, and we doubt God's presence because of his great love for us, because of his amazing grace, and because of his immense mercy, guess what? God has also given us water from the rock, hasn't he? He has given us water from the rock, but our rock is not at Horeb. Our rock is Christ. Our rock is Christ. Paul knew this all too well 
Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. We've already gone over this, right? God was there in the cloud leading them, and they walked through the Red Sea. And that was their, that was their spiritual baptism, if you will. And in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, which we talked about last, last week. That's manna. And all drank the same spiritual drink, which is the water from the rock. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Listen, Jesus is our rock, and from him flows the waters of everlasting life. Flows the waters of everlasting life, and whoever drinks of the water that comes from Christ will never be thirsty again. You see, what happened in the wilderness is a foreshadowing of what happened through Christ. And so I want you to think about this for a little bit. Go back to Moses and what he did. Moses struck the rock, not the people. The people deserved the wrath of God for putting God on trial, for putting God to the test. But instead of them being struck by the wrath of God, the rock was struck. And the water flowed from the rock to save the people. And that water was abundant and sufficient for their salvation, correct? Likewise, Jesus, our rock, was struck for our salvation. Instead of striking us, who deserve the wrath of God because of our sin, God struck His Son, Jesus Christ, our rock, and the living water that flows from Him is abundant and sufficient for our salvation today. He is the one we go to, and He is the one we drink from because He is the fountain of life. And that is what He said Himself in the New Testament. And so the question for you today is, have you drank the waters of everlasting life? Have you turned to Jesus, your rock, and your salvation? And do you turn to Jesus, your rock, for refreshing? That is the question you have to ask yourself today. Is is Jesus my rock? And am I drinking from his fountain that will never go dry? And so I want us to put this all together today. What's your next move? Put this all together. First, we all grow spiritually in different stages. That's where we started here. We all grow spiritually in different stages. And let me, I'm just going to say it. We all put God on trial, even though you might say, well, I don't do that. You probably have or do. We all put him to the test at times in our lives. And yet, we are all invited to drink from the rock. And so, when it comes to your next move, how do we internalize this passage? What are you going to do with this as you walk out of these doors today? Well, first, engage in discipleship. Please. It's not just on me to do that. I'm a part of the body of Christ, and we all have different gifts. And so I pray that you would engage in discipleship in some way, shape, or form. Which means that if you're just coming in here on Sundays and leaving, and that's all we really see you, or if that's all you're really doing, listen, I want to challenge you to kind of step up and step into where God would need you in this body of Christ. Engage in discipleship. Start with your family, and then hopefully you can engage in discipleship within the body of Christ. Next, instead of putting God on trial, trust God. It's, it's that simple. Instead of putting him on trial, trust him. If you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and you know who God is and what God has done for you already to literally wipe out your sin for you, you are now justified to literally now be righteous in the sight of God. If he can do those things, then of course you can trust him with your life today, can't you? Instead of putting him on trial, trust God. Know that he is your provider. Know that he is your protector and know that he is present with you no matter what you're going through. And I know a lot of us are going through things right now. And so I can say that confidently because of God's scripture today. And last, I pray that it is your instinct, your literally spiritual instinct to run to the rock that never runs dry every single day of your life. Turn to Christ because from him, flows the fountain of life. And so if you ever feel like you are thirsty and you feel like you can't keep going and you feel like God is not there, listen, turn to Jesus. 
Turn to Jesus. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 95. So often, we forget that these things are written down for our instructions, for our example, but a lot of these things are written down also so that we can praise God for who He is and what He's done. And I love love Psalm 95. It's so fitting to end with today. It says, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. So if you ever question, why do we sing at church? Right there. You have your answer, okay? It's why we sing before we study. Let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise. So even if you can't sing like me, sing out. It's a joyful noise, right? Might not sound good, but it's joyful. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise for the Lord is a great God. Amen. And a great king above all gods, in his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also, the sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. So now you start to think, okay, how does the Red Sea part? Well, right there, because the sea is his and he made it. And how does water come out of the land, the dry land? Well, because... Right there, his hands formed the dry land. He is the maker and has power over his creation. That's how those things can happen. And then it says, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. So because of who God is and what he's done for us, let us come, worship, and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. As at Massa, Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, because of this, for 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. We need to learn from the example of the Israelites today. Instead of doing the latter part of this, instead of testing them, instead of putting him to the proof, we need to do the top part of this passage, right? Sing to the Lord. Make a joyful noise. Come into his presence. The Lord is great. He is the king above all kings. He is the creator and the sustainer. And because of that, we need to worship and bow down to him. Kneel before him, our maker. He is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the sheep in his hand. And let me tell you today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts like they did at Massa and Meribah. Instead, open your heart to who God is and what God has done for us. And today, I know it's not the first Sunday, so it's throwing some of you off, but today we get to celebrate who God is and what God has done for us, don't we? We get to come to the table of communion. So if the men would come forward today, we get to celebrate what Jesus Christ has done for us. We get to celebrate our rock and our Redeemer. The fact that Jesus was struck for us And from him flows the fountain of living waters. And that's what this table is. This table is a place where all believers can come today. And you can partake in this. But let me tell you this. If you're not walking faithfully with God today, instead of partaking in this with us, use this time as repentance. Let it pass by you and use this time as repentance. But we do invite all believers to join with us today and celebrate our rock, and what Jesus Christ has done for us. Don't let this table become commonplace. 
Don't take this table for granted. But yet it, let it be a reminder of what, what our God has done for us through Christ. And so we're going to begin with the bread today. The bread is a symbol of the body in which Christ took on for you and for me. Philippians 2, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but yet made himself be born and to live just like you and I are living, to be tempted in every single way that we have been tempted. And yet he did it without sin. So we're going to pray for the bread today. I believe that's right. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the careful handling of the word this morning. And Father, as you went to the cross on our behalf, on my behalf, we thank you for that and we praise you this morning. This bread is a reminder of the body in which Christ took on for you and me, a body that was broken, that was struck instead of us. He was willing to give up his body. And he said this to his disciples. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, 
which is given for you. That part always gets me. Given for you and me, you specifically. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's do that together today. Likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And I love this, especially in light of Exodus. We went through the whole Passover passage. This idea that those Israelites had to put their full trust in the blood of that sacrifice. That we too need to put our full trust in the blood of our sacrifice, which is Jesus Christ. And that's what this is a reminder of today. And so Robert's going to pray for the cup. Father, we just continue in prayer this morning and we just thank you for the blood that your son Jesus shed on the cross for us and that even though we're, we're unworthy, you provided that for, that we could spend eternity with you. And Father, that your son willingly gave up his, his life for us, but that he was raised again that we could have everlasting life. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. This cup is a, is a picture of the blood of Christ that was shed for you and for me. 
which justifies us from our sin, wipes it clean all through the sacrifice of Christ. And so we do this in remembrance of him. Let's do that together today. Lord, I I pray that you would um, continue to work the truths of this table deep down into our souls. That the gospel, the fact that you took on human form for us to live amongst us and to die for us, to shed your blood so that we may have forgiveness of sins and salvation. Lord, I pray that the gospel of Jesus Christ would motivate everything we do in life. Lord, we thank you for being struck for us and being the fountain of life that we desperately need. We pray this in your name. Amen.